This video is brought to you by Established Titles. What's up guys, Michael here. Now, if you are a human being on planet Earth with access to the internet, there's a good chance that you've seen, or at least heard about, Squid Game. The South Korean show, which is on pace to become the most watched thing ever on Netflix, explores what happens when a group of down on their luck people get the chance to earn a life-changing amount of money by playing children's games. This sounds light and fun, until the point in the first episode where you find out that losing these games means you're getting murdered on sight. Combining murder and red light, green light is, on its face, pretty bonkers. So unsurprisingly, there's been lots of speculation about what the show is trying to say and what questions it's asking about contemporary life. Some have noted its similarity to The Hunger Games or the Japanese film Battle Royale, while others have noted similarities to Parasite in its class commentary. And while none of these takes are wrong, we think that there might be something more interesting going on in Squid Game. Specifically, via its sadistic made-up game, the show creates a metaphor about the very very real role that debt plays in our society. In particular, we think it's saying that we're all already prisoners of debt, even if we're not currently playing a game of marbles that might get our friend murdered. And this system of debt isn't just something that started with the invention of credit cards. It's an intrinsic feature of society, going all the way back to the days when Christianity was considered a new and edgy religion, the uh, Scientology of its time, if you will. So let's get into the wonderful world of debt in this wisecrack edition on Squid Game. Are we all prisoners of debt? And spoilers ahead for Squid Game, a show that you probably already watched in one sitting. But first, we want to tell you about today's sponsor, Established Titles. Do you, like Wisecrack's unofficial CEO, Rodney Dangerfield, feel like you don't get enough respect? Well, Established Titles can help by turning you into a Scottish laird, aka a lord or lady. Based on the Scottish custom of calling a landowner a laird, which is a real thing, not just something they made up for Outlander, Established Titles offers a titillating trade-off. First, you purchase as little as one square foot of a private estate in Dunfermline, Scotland. In return, Established Titles will send you an official certificate with a fancy-looking crest, and boom, you have an official new title, which you can use to impress people on your dating profile, your credit card, or the name tag you wear to your next high school reunion. But the trade-off doesn't end there. Most importantly, your purchase also helps Established Titles support biodiversity and afforestation efforts. They plant a tree for every order, with global charity partners, One Tree Planted, and Trees for the Future all over the world. A certificate from Established Titles can be a fun and unexpected gift for friends and family. Or you can get romantic with it and buy adjoining plots of land for you and your boo. Plus, it's easy to give as a last minute gift. Visit establishedtitles.com slash wisecrack to snap up your pretty patch of land today. And when you enter code wisecrack at checkout, you'll get 10% off your purchase. That's establishedtitles.com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. First, a quick recap. Giyun is a kind of aimless guy living with his mother, weighed down by so much gambling debt that he can't afford to buy his own daughter a birthday present. While trying to escape his creditors, he meets a sharp-dressed guy who offers to play a little game with him that involves throwing paper cards, slaps across the face, and lots of money. Little does he know that this is a tryout for more games, violence, and money. Soon, Giyun is kidnapped, gassed, and taken to a secret island. There, he and a bunch of other desperate folks get to sleep in the world's tallest bunk beds while they play children's games in the hopes of making bank. Murder ensues, players drop like flies, alliances form and then brutally break, a group of disgusting Americans wearing shiny masks come to spectate, and by the end, we learn that money is not, in fact, a cure for the malaise of modern life. Who would have thought? Now, on its surface, Squid Game's themes seem anything but subtle. There's one group of super desperate people playing deadly games in hopes of improving their lives, and another group of super rich freaks enjoying the psychopathic version of American Ninja Warrior that ensues. Class disparity at its most blatant. But what really makes these characters and the show interesting is the way in which the participants in the game are all there specifically because of their staggering debts. Whether incurred through gambling, smuggling a loved one out of North Korea, or making sketchy deals with mobsters. And this taps into something about contemporary South Korean economic culture, where massive personal debt has become a common feature of life. Everyone seems to owe money, 
whether by way of student loans, mortgages, or ill-fated cryptocurrency investments. And debt and income inequality have skyrocketed in tandem. Per the conversation, household debt in South Korea has risen sharply in recent years to over 100% of its GDP, the highest in Asia. The top 20% of earners in the country have a net worth 166 times that of the bottom 20%, a disparity which has increased by half since 2017. So in the context of the show's setting, the anxiety and panic surrounding debt seems all too relatable, even if you're not licking a sugar cookie to save your life. And a society constructed around credit and debt isn't unique to either Squid Game or South Korea. As of spring 2021, total American household debt was $14.6 trillion. That's 14 with 12 zeros and four commas. And according to a 2021 CNBC report, the average American has a chill $90,460 in debt. What's more, as of the first quarter 2021, the median American household had almost twice as much debt as income. Meanwhile, average student loan debt in America has doubled to $36,635 since just 2007. While payments have been temporarily suspended without interest since 2020, they're about to pick back up. Also. Did you notice how we stopped paying back our, our debt for almost like two years and, and nothing bad happened? And society continued to function like normal? We, weird how that worked out. Anyway, the point is that we've normalized a society in which having tons of debt is just a thing we do. And it's precisely this presupposed normalcy that makes Squid Game feel so chilling and so real. Because the rules of the game don't differ too much from the rules of our own economic world. We see this when the Darth Vader of Squid Game assures the players that they're participating in a truly democratic, egalitarian experiment where everyone has equal opportunity to win. Or, you know, get murdered. And while this sounds absurd, this same logic is at the heart of a society where credit and debt are painted as some kind of equalizer. Take a look at any credit card ad or bank loan website, and you'll see that via credit, you can finally be free. Free to finally get that fancy degree. Free to drive the car of your dreams free to own a home, and even free to get a loan to help you pay off the $10,000 medical debt you have from taking a ride in an ambulance that one time. It's no coincidence that one of the most used credit cards in America is literally called freedom. But this belief in the magical power of credit and subsequent debt isn't a new thing. In fact, according to anthropologist David Graeber and also one Friedrich Nietzsche, the debtor-creditor relationship is a fundamental part of Christianity and Western society as a whole. Graeber notes that Christians practically say as much every time they recite the Lord's Prayer and ask God to forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And it's no surprise that one of the Squid Game players is a fervent Christian, constantly taking prayer breaks and showing how his indebtedness to God parallels the other's indebtedness to various shady lenders. What's more, this transfer of the feeling of religious indebtedness to that of financial indebtedness is summed up here by Italian sociologist and philosopher Maurizio Lazzarato. If in times past we were indebted to the community, to the gods, to our ancestors, we are henceforth indebted to the god capital. We see this religious illusion in the second episode. The giant piggy bank has an ethereal glow to it, and the players stare in reverence as if they were gazing up at the face of God himself. Like Christ for the sinner, this magical piggy bank is capable of redeeming the lives of these indebted mortals. And like religious fanatics who are willing to kill others or harm themselves for the sake of earning spiritual credit from their chosen deity, inside the Squid Game, we see people willing to commit horrible acts. And in the process, they lose their own humanity, all for the promise of redemption through capital. Again, not different from the way people in the real world can lie, cheat, and steal their little hearts out, all for the sake of financial gain. Lazzarato calls this new brand of human defined by relations of debt the indebted man. He describes indebted man in relation to the near universal use of credit cards. Through consumption, we maintain an unwitting relationship with the debt economy. We carry within us the creditor-debtor relation in our pockets and wallets, encoded in a magnetic strip on our credit cards. Indeed, this little strip of plastic hides two seemingly harmless operations, the automatic institution of the credit relation, which thereby establishes permanent debt. The credit card is the simplest way to transform its owner into a permanent debtor, an indebted man for life. 
In Squid Game, we see indebted man and woman left and right, all with problems created by credit and debt that they hope to solve through the magical piggy bank. And while the show mostly focuses on the misery of indebted man, we also see the odd existential misery experienced by creditor man. We eventually learn that the old man, player number one, is actually the host of the game. He switched to being a player because of the deep joylessness he experienced via having too much money. Aw, poor little old rich baby man. But indeed, many argue that South Korea's debt-based financial crises have destroyed civil society. As Yoon Suk Jin, a drama critic and literary scholar, told the New York Times, the South Koreans used to have a collective community spirit. The Times adds that the financial crisis in the late 90s Asia undermined the nation's positive growth story, which Yoon says made everyone fight for themselves. This cutthroat ethos is hardly unexpected. Lazzarato argues that the creditor-debtor relationship not only alienates us from each other, but makes it acceptable for creditors to punish debtors. In past centuries, this punishment was quite brutal. As Graeber notes, in colonial days, an insolvent debtor's ear was often nailed to a post. And the original debt daddy, Nietzsche, explained that in some societies, there were estimated prices for each body part, and the ancient creditor could literally cut off a limb or two depending on how much they were owed. And oh boy, do we see some flesh cut and shot and stabbed and beaten and thrown off various tall towers in Squid Game. The masked leader and minions running Squid Game Island repeatedly absolve themselves of responsibility. Hey, they're just playing by the rules of the game and the players messed up. Fittingly, Lazzarato notes that when it comes to talking about debt, the media, politicians, and economists have only one message to communicate. You are at fault you are guilty. Like those overwhelmed by debt in the real world, players in the game are reminded that it's their fault that they're here. They signed the contract after all, much like someone naively signing a predatory home loan. It's telling that after voting to get the f out of the game in episode two, almost all of the players soon return out of guilt, desperation, or a toxic mix of both. And this blame game played out during the 2008 US financial crisis, where greedy and selfish debtors were blamed for defaulting on predatory loans they never should have been given in the first place. Meanwhile, the big banks that made billions speculating on these high-risk loans got their own glowing piggy bank from the government to make sure they were okay. We see a similar logic in the rhetoric surrounding student loan debt, where 18-year-olds are deemed guilty for signing on for high-interest loans after being told their entire lives that a prestigious college degree is a prerequisite for a lucrative career. And of course, in the character of Sang Woo, we see how even having a great education isn't going to keep you out of trouble but also f Sangwoo, and we'll never forgive him for what he did. So if Squid Game is a sort of metaphor for our debt-riddled age, where we're all trapped in a financial system that we supposedly freely entered into, and from which there is seemingly no escape, does the show give us any clues at how we can break out of this twisted game? <sighs> not really. Because even after Giyun wins the game, he's not happy. The life-changing money he's earned doesn't change the horrors by which he got it. Much like how winning in our current system is never detached from the losing of others. For every well-suited Wall Street superstar, there are thousands of others just trying to make their mortgage payments. Eventually, we see Giyun, with his fancy new haircut, seemingly decide to take the system down. So should we all dye our hair a super bold color and hit the road to seek revenge against the financial systems that has trapped us in debt? Kind of? Lazzarato sees the oppressiveness of debt as akin to the oppression early industrial workers faced in factories, where they were forced to work on reasonable hours under dangerous conditions. And so he thinks that if we want to break out of being indebted humans, that the most urgent task consists in imagining and experimenting with forms of struggle which are as effective at bringing things to a halt as strikes were in industrial society. The Squid Game even alludes to such strikes. <laughs> From there, Lazzarato notes that the stale thinking of capitalists and politicians only register the language of crisis and combat. Rather than trying to win the game then, Lazzarato thinks we have to figure out how to shut down Squid Game Island and its cutesy interior design entirely. But there's also another side of the struggle for Lazzarato, and that's the internal struggle against the guilt associated with debt. He says this not only means annulling debts or calling for default, even if that too would be quite useful, but leaving 
leaving behind debt morality and the discourse in which it holds us hostage. He equates this to Nietzsche's call for an atheism that rejects the guilt associated with spiritual debt. But in this case, he wants us to learn to reject the system of debt that makes us feel guilty for our own financial shortcomings. And Guillaume's newfound swagger seems to indicate that he's given up all the guilt and shame associated with his debts. He seems to realize that this guilt just kept him from focusing his righteous rage on those who are really behind this sick game. So will we see him successfully take revenge against the architects of the Squid Game in Season 2? Or are we in for some sadistic Red Rover? Only the Netflix gods could say for sure. But what do you guys think? Is Squid Game saying that we're already stuck in a game based on credit and debt where nobody will really emerge a winner? Or are we just trying to rationalize our collective student loan debt? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks as always to our amazing patrons, and don't forget to check out our podcast. Hit that subscribe button like you're taking the last marble from your wife, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later. That's the best thing about capital. You just blame anything. Honey, I didn't mean to cheat on you, but capitalist accumulation gave me a desire to prove my masculinity via sexual conquest. So as you see, capitalism cheated on you, not me. Okay. Um, oh, that's recording now. So that's, that's, that's a thing we have. Great.